afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad to be back here on a Friday afternoon. And again, you know, thank you for all of you for signing up and showing up uh, for this session. Uh, this is something of a home ground for me because being a surgeon, wound care is something which I do day in and day out. So I wanted to share the tips and tricks and other uh, things which you can help you to take care of the wound of a patient so that it heals faster. So let me start uh, sharing the presentation. All right. So today's agenda is uh, first I'll talk about the concepts of wound care. Then we'll get into how to assess a wound. This is something which is often missed. And we will get a little bit of, spend a little bit of time on how to assess the wound. Then I'm going to talk about the time uh, wound management uh, protocol. And I think this is a very important concept that has come recently. And I think everyone who manages a wound should be uh, aware of this. And finally, we'll get into some practical uh, tips and tricks while doing dressings and also uh, talk about the various dressings that can be used. So let's first talk about the concepts. So wound healing is a systematic process and it starts uh, with the uh, whenever there is a wound there is bleeding and the first step is to stop the bleeding therefore hemostasis is the first step and uh, next is the uh, inflammation. So here the neutrophils are the main cells the macrophages are just coming in. Then there is a proliferative phase where the fibrin and the, where the wound was there, the fibrin um, plug turns into fibrin, which is um, the scar, and then the collagen elastin synthesis and the epithelial cells slowly start coming in. And the fourth is the re-epithelization. That is the skin over the wound gets uh, formed again. And finally, uh, what takes months or years, the remodeling of the wound keeps going on for a long time. So this is the nature's answer for any wounds uh, we get. And our role is to just promote and support the healing process. So many times, what we do as intervention actually opposes the healing process. So we should understand what are the things which actually promote and, and we should support the healing process. So this is a basic uh, wound healing uh, um, <clears throat> pathway and the reason I put it up is to emphasize that nature does a fantastic job and our job is to just support it to do the job uh, uh, to get the job done. So the other important concept you know, it actually you know, was recognized in the 1960s itself but it took a long time for it to come to the mainstream and this is the importance of moisture. It is very sad that even as of today many of the persons who take care of the wound are not focusing on this aspect of wound care. It has been proven beyond doubt that humidifying the wound and the wound environment dramatically affects the wound healing process. It hastens it, it makes it much faster, it is less painful for the patient and there are so many other advantages. On the other hand, when there is excessive exudate that leads to excessive moisture in the wound, then it leads to a uh, uh, lot of hydration of the wound, which is not a, really a good thing. And this is you know, causes damages to the surrounding skin. This is known as maceration. And uh, that causes further ulceration. You would have seen in many patients who you know have colostomy and ileostomy this happening because of excessive moisture, you can see around the ostomies, there is much uh, no further you know, uh, ulceration happening. So, several terms like moisture retaining, moisture balance, and moisture supplying dressings have come into work. So, you should understand the most important term you have to understand is moisture balance. Neither should it be too much, nor should it be too low. You need to keep the right amount of moisture for the wound to heal. And this is something which we can support so that the nature takes care of the healing process uh, quickly. And there are several factors which affect wound healing, that all of which uh, we should aim to control. The blood supply is the most important thing, more, both the microvasculature and the macrovasculature. So if the patient has any arterial disease or venous disease, the wounds uh, don't heal that well. 
and also pressure points wherever there is pressure points you must be well aware that you know pressure ulcers but if anyone who's got a wound we should make sure that you know that wound is not under any excessive pressure and then neuropathy would lead to loss of sensation and uh, that's something which we need to uh, be careful about i already spoke about the venous disease arterial disease and systemic problems like diabetes, obesity also affect wound healing. So we need you know, to see, make sure, see the patient as a whole, not just the wound, and make sure we control the other comorbidities and uh, especially diabetes and make sure that the wound is supported in its healing process. The other important uh, factor to consider is there are totally separate set of um, sort of steps to take care of an acute wound versus a chronic wound. So what do you mean by an acute wound? Is an acute wound which will heal in four weeks. No, normal surgical wounds will fall into this category. A wound that does not heal within four weeks is then termed as a chronic wound. And then your um, way in which you take care of the wound varies slightly. But the general principles are the same. So that's about the general concepts I wanted to talk about that wound healing is a natural process. The body just needs support and more importantly, we should not oppose the process. And then important concept is the moisture balance. Very, very important. And don't forget about the systemic factors that can affect wound healing. So these are very important concepts to remember. Now let's get into how we assess the wound. So the wound as a uh, my, all of us will be well aware, consists of these major features. It has got an edge, it has got a margin, and it has got a floor and also a base. So what is a floor? Floor is the exposed surface of the wound. So what you see on, on, uh, on the base, on the, on the surface of the wound, uh, is called the floor. And the edge is the area between the margin and floor. Okay, so the edge of the wound is the you know, um, area between the margin and the flow. And the base is the surface on which the ulcer rests. So if the surface is a nice um, base, then the healing takes place uh, faster. But if it's on uh, um, very, uh, for example, if it is on a bone, then they, especially in a place like the shin, shin bone, uh, the tibia, then the healing is impaired. And the margin is the junction between the wound and the normal epithelium. Okay, so that is the margin and uh, the edge is the area between the margin and the floor. So that is the, uh, as you can say, the wall. The wall is the edge and the margin is the um, area, normal uh, skin and the wound area. So that is the uh, margin. Now the first thing which I would talk about is wound measurement. As we talk in quality and so also in wound care, what is measured is not improved. So many times we omit this you know, uh, this part of management. We just keep doing the wound dressing and uh, rely on your you know, uh, assessment, uh, just in eyeing the wound and assessing it whether it is increasing or not. Dedicated wound care professionals will frown upon this. So it doesn't take much of a time. So we need to capture it. Now all of us have got mobile phones. So it's very easy to capture the wound, photograph the wound and you can really see the difference happening over time. And then you measure to see the dimensions of the wound, record it meticulously in the patient's case sheet. By this way, you can monitor the healing progress. So it's very important to do this wound measurement. So how do you do the wound measurement? So when you measure, the first uh, principle to remember is that the head is the 12 o'clock and the foot is the six o'clock. And this is the width of any wound. So when you measure head, you no, know, uh, but from, that is from the head of the patient to the uh, foot of the patient, it is the width of the uh, wound. And then perpendicular to that, when you measure from nine o'clock to three o'clock, that is the length of the wound. So people you now will always get confused, which is the length and which is the uh, width of the wound or breadth of the wound. So this is how you uh, define what is the uh, width and the length. So the length is from 9 to 3 and the width is from 12 to 6. So here you can see that um, the width is here that is from 12 to 6 and the length is between 9 to 3. So this is the skin and that's the wound. 
Now, why this picture is put is because in an irregular wound, the widest part is the, actually the width of the wound. So here you can see it's almost uni uniform. Here you can see here it is the width is the maximum. So this is the width you should record. The widest part of the wound is what you should record. And similarly, the widest, I mean, the longest length is what you should measure. So that's why this uh, picture is there. The other thing is the depth of the wound. Okay, so how do you measure all this is uh, use a culture and sensitivity uh, stick. You know, these are sterile sticks which uh, you take for culture and sensitivity. It has got a small cotton bed at the end. So by gentle uh, probing of the wound, you can use this stick and a scale to measure these dimensions, the width, the length, and the, um, um, the depth or the uh, height of the wound. And then you talk about the undermining. So what is undermining? So the undermining is the area of the ulcer under the skin. So there may be some a flap of skin over the wound and this part is actually not exposed. So usually this can be missed and this is where the infection and other biofilms collect. So it's very important to understand what is the level of undermining. So you measure that in also. And finally, you also see if there's any tunneling. Tunneling is an, a deeper aspect, you know, a small uh, sort of tunnel from the base of the wound and from the depth of this to the base of the wound is the length of the tunnel. So that's something, I'm sorry, from the surface of the wound to the deepest part of the tunnel is the tunnel depth. So these are things you should measure when uh, measuring the wound. Usually, again, length, breadth, and uh, um, the depth is usually measured, but also see if there is any undermining or tunneling, and also note down the measurements of these as well. Now, after the measurement, you've got to see what is the wound bed looking like. So this picture is very nice. It explains what are all the uh, uh, things which you can see in the uh, base of the wound. So you can have very good healthy granulation tissue or you can have slough or you can see a bit of bone being exposed or this is tenacious slough in the sense, you no, know, this slough when you wipe it with gauze, it will go off. This will won't. So that is known as tenacious slough and also the black dead tissue is known as a necrotic tissue. Any of these can be present in the base of the ulcer, base of the wound as well. Now, because of this difference in color, many people have tried to classify it based on the traffic light system. The un Unfortunately, the uh, traffic light is inverted in the wound. Okay, you will see that. So the black is the necrotic uh, part. Then the yellow or you know, sometimes green is the infection and slough. And these are all you know, things which are not good. And next it will become red if the wound is healing because of the granulation tissue, which is actually good. And finally, when the epithelium forms, it is actually a rosy pink in color. So many times I will find that a lot of patients come to my OP saying the wound is not healed for three months like that. And what is happening is the wound is being you know, uh, subjected to a lot of trauma because when this epithelium uh, grows, it looks like a faded white thing. People mistake it for slough and keep you know, removing it. So the wound never heals. So all I'll do is put an occlusive dressing for a week and the you know, epithelium will you know, form. The body just does its job. And when the patient comes back and I remove the occlusive dressing, which is not disturbed at all, they just keep it for four days, then I'll renew it, you know, keep it for another four days. Like that, if you do it, the wound will heal. And the patient thinks that you are such a magician. Now you did something that made the wound heal. But actually what we did is, we just left the nature alone to do its job. So she should know when to intervene and when not to intervene. Very, very important in uh, managing a wound. Now, the next thing in a wound characteristic is the wound discharge or wound exudate. So we have several types of wound discharge. The serous is uh, not very um, bad. Serous anginous is when there is mixed with blood. Purulent is what you should be looking at. And if it is purulent, then you should start worrying and start intervening. And sometimes in you no, know, there can be blood also in your dressing. So these are the different types of exudate. And some of the wounds have are dry. They don't have any exudate. For example, diabetic foot wounds are very dry. 
Some have low exudates and some will have very high exudates. So your choice of dressing will depend upon the, the amount of exudate which comes off, off from the wound. We'll talk about it more when we're talking about the dressing materials. So you now you can understand all these are very, very important you know, in assessing. Only in you assess, then you can manage. So next is the sign of signs of infection. So in an acute wound, it's the usual pain that is the you know uh, dolor, calor, do, you know, um, rubber, and all those Greek terms. So basically, there will be pain, there will be warmth. Uh, you can see the redness. The edema will be there, so there will be swelling. And because of the pain, the you know uh, the patient will not be moving that part of the body. Uh, or, <clears throat> so these are the five cardinal signs of inflammation. So it's very easy to detect it in the acute wounds. But the chronic wounds is not like that. It's very, very difficult to detect infection because it goes on for a long time and the uh, signs can be very subtle. So in chronic wounds, any one of these factors means there could be infection. So the healing is delayed or the granulation tissue is unhealthy. Though it is granular, it is not that bright red. You do not look that unhealthy red. So that's an unhealthy granulation tissue. And then new areas of slough will start forming. The edge will start getting undermined. And then the, you, know, you can feel the malodor, you know, the stink in the, whenever you go near the patient. And sometimes the whole wound break, breaks on. Looks like it was healing. Then suddenly when you open the dressing, you know, the whole wound has broken down. So these are all signs of infection. So be careful to note of these signs uh, when you are taking care of a chronic uh, wound. So that's about measuring the wound and assessing the wound. You know, very important. So we saw how to measure and how to assess the various wound characteristics and also the exudates and how to identify the signs of infection in both acute wounds as well as chronic wounds. Now we are getting into the uh, time uh, protocol for managing wounds. So what is this? So basically, as I told you, wound management is a process of taking care of the wound. And we use both local interventions as well as systemic interventions uh, to keep the wound healthy and to allow the healing process. Now, this uh, protocol, TIME, uh, was developed in 200, 2002, sorry, 2002, uh, beginning of the, this century, by wound care experts. So it's not new. And it is a practical guide for managing patients. A uh, spin-off of this is moist. No? Uh, one group has again read this and call it moist wound management. We won't get into that. It's basically a very uh, small change. They added oxygen into this. Um, I feel it's basically industry. But time is, you know, is a very uh, good uh, thing, acronym to remember to manage any wound, both acute and chronic. So what is this? We will see. T is, stands for tissue management. I for inflammation and infection control. M for moisture balance. And E for epithelial or edge advancement. You, know, you, you sort of do something to allow the edge to advance. So we look at it one by one. So in the tissue part of it, when you look at the wound, you ask yourself the question, is there any non-viable tissue in the wound? Are there any parts of the wound which is not deficient and which needs to be replaced? So if the wound is very deep, if the wound is very large, then it's a deficient. You don't heal by itself. So you need to use grafting or other plastic surgery procedures to you know, heal the wound. So it's very, very important to assess this you know, when you're looking at the T part. Look at the tissue. And as I told you, the various things like undermining, tunneling, uh, signs of infection, the uh, color of the base, all these gives indication about non-viability and you know, whether the wound is deficient. Next, you look at signs of infection or inflammation. This is already we touched upon. And M is for moisture. So is there too little moisture or is this too much of moisture? You should assess. On Based on that, you, you will uh, select your uh, dressings. And E is the edge. So many times, you can see like here, the edge will be overhanging and it is not flush with the wound and thereby it is unable to grow. See, the epithelium can grow only the skin is flush with the granulation tissue. So here what we need to do, we need to sort of trim the edges so that it becomes flush and allow the uh, 
uh, epithelialization to take place. Or if it is unhealthy, then you know also you debride it. So the edge is very, very important because edge is from where the epithelial cells will grow to cover the uh, wound. So the TIME is a very good acronym. The tissue, infection, moisture, and edge management is what we should do. So it applies both to chronic wounds and to acute wounds to prevent, no, uh, uh, so that acute wounds don't progress to chronicity. Now, I've tried to summarize the whole uh, time wound management in one slide. We'll see whether no, you, uh, you appreciate that or whether I've done a good job. So you have the, you know, the uh, necrotic, that is the black in the top, the infected, the white, the granulating, the red, and the epithelializing, the pink type of wound, uh, which you need to manage. Now, very important to understand that you need to intervene for the necrotic and infected uh, wound. Do not intervene for granulating and uh, epithelizing wound. By intervening meaning, don't do anything that will stop the process, okay? Here, you have to kickstart the process. That is a necrotic and infected wound. You have to kickstart the process of healing. Here, the healing is going on well. You should make sure you just support it. So intervene for the top two. Do not intervene for the bottom two. Now, in the tissue management, for the top two, you need to do debridement. You will do debridement either by chemical, enzymatic debridement, or physical, that means as like a surgeon, I'll take the knife and take off all the necrotic tissue. And also you need to use the you know, appropriate dressings based on the exudate. We will talk about it shortly. In the granulating and epithelializing wound, the present concept is called undisturbed wound care, UWC. Okay, this is a new terminology, relatively new. So undisturbed wound care means you just now, put an occlusive dressing and leave that wound alone. Do not try to uh, do anything to it. Do not keep the, changing the dressing frequently and all those things. So, undisturbed wound care applies to granulating and epithelizing wound. And you should use the appropriate dressings for this purpose. So, that is the tissue management. The infection, again, for the necrotic and infected slough, you need to use systemic antibiotics. You can use ointments. So, basically, ointments are traditional ointments like Misiprosin, uh, mipirosin, sorry, mipirosin, um, any of those you know, um, anti anti antiseptics which are used like betadine and other things. Or you, you have some uh, newly uh, available ointments you know, where hydrogels are impregnated with stem cells and other things. They are coming on the market. Very expensive, but that is supposed to stimulate wound healing. But anyway, whatever it is, you use both local and systemic uh, measures for necrotic and infected stuff. If there is pus, you do incision and drainage. If there is necrotic tissue, debridement, or use de chemical debriding agents. All this, a combination of this you'll use to um, eradicate infection and to kickstart the healing process. In the granulating wound, none of these are required. Just leave the wound alone. No, that's what it's uh, very important to understand. Next is moisture control. So if there is a high exudent, you need to use an absorbent dressing or you can use VAC therapy where you continuous low suction is used to take those uh, uh, discharge or exudate from the uh, wound. If it is a low exudate, you put the appropriate dress dressing to just to uh, maintain the moisture and not to dry it out. In the granulating and epithelial would also moisture balance is very, very important. So that is why, you know, traditional dressings like gauze and G-pad for these wounds actually uh, delays wound healing here. We need to use dressings that will maintain the moisture. And finally, age management, you need to debride it in the uh, necrotic and infected wound. Here you have to protect the edge. You now the edge is healthy and it is trying to grow the epithelial cells. So make sure you protect the edge and make sure that they are not traumatized. So this is how you manage the uh, using the time wound management protocol, these four types of wounds. These are the major types of wounds you will encounter in your clinical practice. So with that uh, knowledge, let us get into how to you know, select a dressing and how to do dressings for the wound. So dressing on the wound is a very simple procedure. You prepare, first prepare you know, the equipment and all that which is needed for the dressing. I'm not going to go much into detail. 
and then prepare the skin around the uh, wound so that there is no, you disinfect the skin around the wound when you do the dressing so that you don't contaminate the wound during dressing. Then you have to clean the wound and then dress the wound. These are the three basic steps of doing a dressing. So how do you prepare? You need to disinfect the uh, skin around the wound using appropriate antiseptic. Mostly povidone iodine is used. Sometimes people who are allergic to iodine, you can use chlorhexidine to disinfect, just like surgical and not uh, skin disinfection. Make sure the betadine and other chemicals do not get into the wound. So that is important to prepare the skin around the wound while doing wound care. In cleaning, you can use several agents to clean the wound. These are known as irrigating agents. They include sterile or clean water and uh, ringer solution or saline solution. There are several others which are also used like hydrogen peroxide, povidone iodine, you know, uh, alcohol, um, tincture benzoin. You know, I still remember those painful times where they'll put the you know, tincture and put a cotton onto the wound. You know, whenever I get injured when I was a boy and it will just get stuck to the wound. So every time we take it out, the epithelium will come off along with the cotton. And also acetic acid, 2% acetic acid is also used. Mainly they say it is good for pseudomonas. But several studies have shown that all these agents, hydrogen peroxide, povidone iodine, povidone iodine works only on intact skin. If you put it on any wound, you know, that is organic tissue, it gets inactivated immediately. So it's in, you know, not only is inefficient, you know, it also you know, causes, it's toxic to the tissues. Again, same with alcohol. Tinja benzoin is again you now toxic to the wound as well as to the patient. Acetic acid, 1%, 2%. Judiciously, you can use whenever you know, there is uh, for chemical debridement or to get rid of the contamination, but it has to be with for a very timed period. So most uh, countries have banned all these uh, agents, but in India, these are freely available. Uh, that's the tragedy. So you no, know, it is uh, self-control. Uh, uh, we have to use and also lack of knowledge. Many people don't know that these are harmful because the seniors are using, they also start continue use, using this. So the best thing is to use either saline or sterile water because in our uh, uh, country, tap water is not very clean. So we need to use you know, sterile water or uh, saline and sometimes people say you can also use RO water. So these are you now for chronic wounds. For uh, acute wounds, definitely sterile water or sterile saline. Now, we are coming to the dressing part. Now, what is an ideal dressing? This is like any other thing. They will list a lot of characteristics and then say, as of today, no, such a dressing does not exist. So what is that one very important thing is you should have humidity. Okay. And also it should remove excess. It should have moisture balance. The dressing should not have toxic particles and it should protect the wound from further trauma. When you room it also, there should not be trauma, both to the wound and to the patient. Okay, impermeable to bacteria. Maintain the temperature. Allow air to go, pass in and through. Should be comfortable, conformable to the over the joints and other you know, uh, parts of the body. Require infrequent changes and cost effective that's the most important thing and long shelf life okay many of the dressings actually will tick uh, you know, almost majority of boxes except the cost effective one right? and especially the modern ones okay so let's look at them so wound dressing has to be trilaminar so the trilaminar is the inner part which is in contact with the raw area of the wound should be non-adherent, meaning it should not stick to the wound. This is the non-adherent layer. Then you need a layer which is can absorb the exudate. That is the absorbent layer. And then the third layer is the retaining layer. Very simply, if you're putting a Gamgee pad dressing, you should put a paraffin gauze, you know, because paraffin is non-adherent on the wound. That is the non-adherent layer. Then you put the Gamgee pad, which has got a thick, Wad of cotton covered by gauze, that is the absorbent layer. And then you use a bandage or a tape to retain it. So this is simple. We are using it day in and day out. Trilaminate layer, dressing layer, dressing is what we use 
day in and day out. And this is uh, the uh, principle behind it. So the non-adherent layer and adjoining layer are known as the primary dressing. And the retaining layer is known as the secondary dressing. Okay. So the, there are several wound dressings. Uh, we will classify them as traditional and uh, modern. Traditional, uh, we will classify them based on adherence. How badly or how well they stick to the wound. Because if they stick to the wound, it's bad. So when the adherence is high, the gauze and cotton we use will get adherent. And every time you remove, there will be pain to the patient. It dries quickly. So it gets stuck to the uh, wound and it does not retain or supply moisture. So low adherence is the paraffin and tole. You know, we use this uh, paraffin gauze. Uh, you can either prepare it yourself or it is available commercially. Um, so this is the traditional dressings we use for majority of patients even now. So mainly because of cost and mainly because of ignorance, I think. Now, the modern dressings, again, as I said, moisture is a very important aspect of wound healing. In the modern understanding of wound healing, we will classify them as moisture retaining and moisture supplying. So if the moisture retaining low or films, okay, I'll talk about it you now also what films are, what foam is and all those very quickly. So just to you know, go through this. So low moisture retaining are the films high moisture retaining or the foam dressings. And there are dressings which will supply moisture to the wound and these are the hydrocolloids, hydrogels and the alginates. Okay, so these are the modern uh, wound dressings. Now, let's look at it one by one. So the films, you will be uh, familiar with these, some of these trade names. Mepor, Opside, Tegadam. Okay, none of this company are paying me any money as for this lecture. But just for familiarity, I'm just telling you because many of us don't call it films, right? So these are, now as you can see here, thin films. They may have some absorbent layer or sometimes just thin film. And these are sterile plastic sheets of polyurethane coated with hypoallergenic adhesive. Okay, 3M is one of the companies which makes these. And their you know, adhesive is very, very you know, good. And when we talk about moisture, we will talk about retaining moisture or supplying moisture. These dressings retain the moisture because you know, you, it is an occlusive dressing. And also, they are they can breathe. So many times, the uh, objection to using these films on patients, especially many surgeons, will say, in our country where there is so much of heat, you don't put occlusive dressing because uh, gauze and G-pad will breathe and this will not allow the wound to breathe. Not true. These plastic sheets are made in such a way they are actually have micro pores and this will allow the air to move in and out. Okay. So it retains the moisture, but it does not supply moisture. Absorbent is low. It has a very thin layer if at all. And if there is a little bit of more exudate, it will lift off. So very low absorbent capability. So where all will you use it? Any clean wound with low exudate, you can use it. Typical example is post-operative wounds, skin aberrations, chronic wounds you know, on the leg and uh, pressure ulcers, which are superficial, and also superficial burns. So these are areas you can use films. Now hydrocolloid is actually, uh, we will say, we can say it's a workhorse of the modern dressing. This can be used for almost any type type of wound, you no, know, as long uh, you use it properly. So some of the trade names are duodem, uh, duoderm, comfield. Okay, so these are could be any of these chemicals in combination. Okay, sodium carboxy methyl cellulose, gelatin, pectin, elastomers, and adhesives. These are bonded together and made into a film. See, like these sort of brown sheets you can see, right? In various sizes, they are available, and they are again semi permeable. Okay. They are flat and they will stick on the one. Very good advantage. You don't need anything to uh, you know, uh, do that. It will stick on and because of the warmth, it becomes sticks more. Okay, And it forms a gel promoting moisture. Many times, because of the warmth, this gel will sometimes leak out of the dressing and it can be mistaken for pus. It's actually the gel you know, which actually liquefies because of the body temperature. 
So it has got good retaining capability, moisture retaining capability, but it does not supply uh, much of moisture. Absorbency is moderate. No, it'll, to an extent, it will absorb and liquefy. We can keep the dressing for three days, four days uh, without changing it. And uh, as I said, it is a workhorse uh, uh, for most dressings. Most acute and chronic wounds that are not infected can be, uh, this can be used. Definitely, you can use it for granulating and epithelizing. So this is the trick you know, I was telling you in the beginning to you now make any non uh, healing wood is being disturbed often to heal. Okay, so that is the hydrocolloid dressings. Now, hydrogel dressings, uh, some of the trade names are Restore, Aquadom, Suprasorb. So it is a matrix of polymers with 96%. You know, mostly it has got water content. So it, these dressings are very cool. It, you know, it actually reduces the pain to the patient and they donate water. You no, know, I said, you no, know, that moisture giving, supplying my dressing is one of the dressings and maintains a moist environment. It is moisture retaining capacity, moisture supplying. To, it has got moderate absorbent capability. And this is mainly used in you know, diabetic ulcers, which are dry, or sometimes also with the slough, which you want to de-slough, so, but not infected. So, and uh, you can use, and you no, know, if you leave them alone, or if you put dry, you know, uh, gauze or gamji pad, they'll dry up. So when you put this hydrogel dressing, the moisture keeps the, loosens the slough and they will come off. Okay, so pressure ulcers, uh, cavity wounds, leg ulcers, graft and donor sites. So many times, you now you put the dressing on the donor side and you remove it, it will be very painful because paraffin gauze, even if you put, it dries up because those donor sites, you won't remove it for almost two weeks. Okay, so you can use these. Diabetic ulcers, as I said, they are dry. Uh, you can also use it for post-op surgical wounds lacerations and abrasions, okay, as long as they are not infected. So that's about hydrogel dressing. And then is the alginate, common trade names are Caltostat, algae cell, fibrocol. Now it is actually made from seaweed, okay, it's a naturally occurring calcium and sodium salt. They absorb 50 to 20 times their weight in water, very absorbent, not dressing. It will be like cotton candy. You know, they come in large sheets or small sheets. So even when there is you no know, uh, a large area which is bleeding, surgeons use it to actually control bleeding. Okay, so it can retain moisture, it can supply moisture, as it, you, know, you can see here, and it is very, very absorbent, high absorbent capability. So it is used to stop bleeding in traumatic and post-operative wounds, bleeding from accidents. And actually it absorbs all the odor, because seaweed, it absorbs all the odors from the wound and you know that uh, you don't stink that bad, even in infected wounds. And you can use it in dry wounds and infected wounds with high exudates. So this, oh no, this has to be changed frequently because these are high exudates, these are infected wounds and uh, you use it to absorb these exudates and use it to uh, give it uh, um, uh, moisture. So that's about alginate. And then foam is, you know, the, they're called alvin life or permafoam. These are just a polyurethane or silicone foam, usually for very deep wounds, you know, especially peri perineal wounds and all that can be deep. So you can just put the uh, foam in place and it'll take the shape of the wound, thereby the absorption layer is uh, you know, uh, large and it will prevent leakage of exudate outside. And then you can put a retaining layer and, and a dressing. So they you know, they have uh, retaining capacity. They don't supply moisture, but they're very absorbent. They take in a lot of uh, exudate. So deep pressure wounds, deep ulcers, wounds with heavy exudates is what you use. So now we can see, if you know the characteristics of the dressing, you can choose your dressing according to the one, the type of the wound, whether it's necrotic, sluffy or infected, granulating or um, epithelializing. And also based on the exudate, whether it is high or low. And also, if you know, very importantly, if the wound is infected or not. There are certain dressings which cannot be used for a long time. For example, hydrocolloid, you can't just put it for three, four days in an infected wound. Okay. So with these four parameters, okay, the uh, type of the wound, the uh, moisture, um, the presence of infection, all these uh, and the exudates, you can select the proper dressing. So quick word on vac dressing. 
So they are also known as negative pressure wound therapy, NPWT, where you, know, you have a watertight seal on the wound, uh, and then there is a tube which is connected to a motor which keeps continuously running, 24 hours, 24 by 7. So what happens is the exudate keeps slowly coming out and gets stored in this reservoir. Thereby, not only the moisture is kept, the excess exudate is also taken out. And it causes dramatic, you know, uh, wound healing times. You know, they just the wound edge will come together. These also can be kept for about five days to maybe sometimes a week. And uh, again, you have to be very selective in uh, very in selecting the right wound for this type of uh, treatment. So that uh, brings me to the end of uh, this uh, talk on wound care and wound dressing. So let me summarize it. So as I said. We have necrotic wounds, infected uh, or wounds with slough, granulating wounds, and epithelial uh, wounds. So when you look at the tissue part of it, the top two, you need to debride and de-slough and make sure you eradicate infection to make it, prime it for healing. And then the granulating and epithelial wound is the undisturbed wound care. Don't disturb it. Just allow the nature to do its work. I is the infection part of it. Necrotic and infected will need systemic and local treatment, antimicrobials, whereas the bottom two, granulating and epithelizing, do not need either local ointments or um, uh, and antibiotics. They definitely need the proper dressing. So there are also ointments which are, you know, like uh, hydrogel ointments are available. So if at all using ointments, use that type of ointment rather than some ointment of the antimicrobial because those antimicrobials can actually harm the delicate epithelial tissue. M is the moisture. Moisture balance is the mantra. Okay. So depending on the exudate, you use absorbent dressing or moisture balancing dressing. For the granulating and epithelizing use, use moisture balancing dressing. That's just the right amount of moisture. And the edge management in the uh, infected and uh, uh, necrotic wounds, you have to debride it, the edge, so that it becomes flush with the surface so that the epitheliums can start growing. In the granulating and epithelial wounds, that's already happening. So make sure they don't get traumatized. You protect the edge so that the epithelium will start growing. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the session.